So the scientists, engineers, research scholars, PhD students, professors put lots of effort in, de in developing a new technology and having the phone in nature. So they are the other side of the table. I assume that in the whole group, all of us are on the other side of the table. We are here protecting their inventions, protecting their technology. So lots of resources they spend, lot of efforts, then they come to us. I will not say that this is the only way, but generally most of the meditation companies or organizations, first as soon as they get the uh, invention, they do a prior art search. So you have search department, or you have uh, some, some people call it as analytics, some people call it technology specialists, searchers, patent, uh, patent searchers, technology specialists, they do the search. Then once they establish an already a different event, they come to the patent lawyers, patent engineers, patent associates, different teams, IP councils. So they have the application and they have to get the patent. They, they have to face the prosecution, they have to go to law, office actions, first office actions, second office actions, appeals, and they get the patent granted in one And you all know the patent rights are territorial, and it's not in one jurisdiction, they have to go to other jurisdictions. Especially if you have entered the European community or foreign countries, the most expensive thing is translation costs. Recently, I was reading the, our, one of our clients wanted to file his application in Turkey, and they said that for every month, 50 words of translation would cost 20 dollars. So, so much of money went into developing a patent application. How many patent applications are converting into real, into real industrial applications? Yes. One use is I develop a technology, I may use it, I may commercialize. But is that the only way I can make money out of so much money I spent? How do I make money out of my IP? Like go this talk, it says patent monetization, you may touch upon all different types of IP. How do I make money out of my IP? So why I would ask my esteemed panelists here, why should we monetize our patents and why should it be a strategy of my whole strategy part? Why patent monetization should be my strategy? I want to know. Thank you, Dr. So, I think from a corporate perspective, as Pradhani mentioned, there is a lot of investment that goes into what we develop uh, in terms of technologies for a product or service that we offer. And for a particular problem that we are solving in a product, we would tend to spend on research with different types of solutions not everything might be the end solution that we would offer to the market. But we still would protect all those and the invention that eventually you know, goes into the market might be one of say 20 or 100 depending on the product uh, that you're working on or the technology that you're working on. So what happens to the, all the investment? How do we recover the return on investment? is what we may want to evaluate and see what are the other avenues by which we could recover those. So monetization becomes one of the tools by which we could do that. Uh, so this is on the part where we work on how much we have invested and what can we do with what we have you know, kept as assets, which necessarily doesn't contribute to the sales of the product that we offer. The second part is on the collaboration part and, and partnerships where we work with uh, joint development partners, suppliers, and there there would be also requirements. Not everything may be owned by us, invented by us. How can we collaborate? Can there be avenues where we can cross license, provide those, and make money and make a product out of those? So those are typically some of the avenues by which we can recover the investment that we have made uh, for developing a lot of technologies that we need to do. So I think that those are ways in which we would, maybe in, in terms of corporate, I think that is how we would try to recover uh, the assets uh, that we've invested in. So, thank you, Dr. Ramni. Any company makes investment, so it's for them, they want to create assets for themselves and for the uh, assets for the investor. So if you have IP, it's considered as an asset, so whether it's taken or so, important for the company is that whatever the value of that uh, asset is, that has to be realized. So, monetization becomes one of the important things. So, every company, can, companies cannot go to product, make a product for every 
why IP monetization is necessary. Uh, well, innovation is needed. There's, there's no denial of the fact. Uh, and when we talk about IP, we talk about creating innovative product and processes. Well, innovation is needed for the greater good, but when we talk about corporate level, you need to justify your ROI. And uh, the very fundamental fact, if you look at the stats across the world, the percentage of commercialized intellectual property is less than 10%. And this, this goes across different industries. Yeah, there are a few companies who boast of you know, having a higher success rate, but the figure would stand somewhere around that. So it's very essential that when we're talking about uh, developing a technology strategy or IP strategy, we take into consideration how we can maximize uh, revenue generation from intellectual property. Now coming to the second aspect of it, IP monetization is different for a corporate like us and the strategies would be different for institutes and it's going to be different for startups, going to be different for patent trolls. And often I see whenever I talk on this topic, one of my favorite topics, I always see people only correlate IP monetization with licensing, uh, which is, I would say, it's not a comprehensive way of putting across that's what we mean by IP monetization. For industry like us, we create IP so that we need, don't need to license in technologies from others. And by doing so, we make sure that you know we generate value for the company. Our main forte is not licensing out, and that would be true for most of the corporates. Of course, the technologies are evolving. They are, they are platform technologies which could be applicable for many other industries. But having said that, at times, uh, Ramesh touched upon this point and it's very important in respect. The emerging trends that what we have seen in the last couple of decades is just not that we are creating IP for your own benefits, but technologies are becoming so networked within other industries. I think previous panel was also discussing about that you need to complement each other. And people are not ready to give you technologies for money. So what are the options left for you? You need to te create technologies, you need to create an IP which can be complementing to each other. And that's where the cross-licensing itself is a very important mean of IP monetization. Uh, when we talk about startups, uh, the only bread and butter they have is a novelty. They bring on the table. How they leverage that is very essential. It becomes the very, very critical part of their IP monetization strategies. And for corporates, when you're spending hundreds and thousands of crores on R&D, at times it also happens that you come across uh, intellectual property which is not in your main portrait. Uh, it's on the periphery of your businesses. Now, many times you evaluate those you see how can you leverage those. So sometimes creating spin-offs, small spin-offs, just to evaluate and test whether it works or not. So essentially, uh, I would like to say when we talk about IP monetization, uh, it's, a, you know, it's a combination of many aspects. It's just not about licensing. And it's different for different set of entities. And you need to understand whether you're a startup, you're a research institute, you're a corporate R&D. Uh, and that's accordingly, you know, you need to take into consideration the strategic aspect of monetization. Though the topic is called internet monetization, means you kept on saying IP monetization. We all know that there are many types of IP, right? We don't have only patents, we have trademarks, we have copyrights. So, Monique, do you think that can have an interplay in the monetization? Each, what does one IP has uh, any interplay with the other IP forms? And especially for patents, we also have know-how. How does know-how play an important role in patent monetization? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, often, you know, when we talk about IP, uh, and most of the IP conferences, people correlate IP largely with patents. And 
especially when you have a partner lawyer sitting across. Uh, having said that, technologies gets conceptualized. Technologies evolve, they mature, and they are taken over by new technologies. That's, that's a fundamental law of nature. You don't see a single technology which will survive. Now, having said that, if you de develop a technology, you need to understand how you can exploit other forms of intellectual property to maintain that sustenance in the market. And here, the role of other forms of intellectual property become very, very important. Whether we talk about designs, uh, often when we talk about designs, Apple, you know, landmark, round edge phone comes in my mind. But it has given them a big edge in the market in terms of creating a name in the design, and which they are leveraging today also. They are known for their designs. Similarly, if you are a startup, you come up with a new technology and you are not giving proper consideration to leverage that technology and not associating with the trademark. It may happen that your technology becomes obsolete sometime. But if you have made your mark by associating it with the trademark, people would always recognize you that you brought in so and so technology. That's very, very critical. <clears throat> Other very important aspect when we talk about uh, technical side, uh, and I'm talking about industrial technologies, the know how is a very, very critical part. And let me just give you very brief perspective the kind of industry we come from. The typical technology development cycle itself is 5 to 8 years. Now having said that, you keep on filing patents right from TRL1 stage to, you know, it keeps on going to TRL4, 5. And when technology go for upscaling, there's a less interplay of patent per se. You create more of improvements, uh, you generate more of know-how, uh, of course, you know, trade secrets at times, but it's more of a know-how. Now you are effectively less left with, say, a time period of seven to eight years to take care of your IP-based advantages. But every company wants to extend those. And that's where the know-how part becomes very important. First of all, we need to consider that the interplay of know-how when we talk about technology development. And know-how become more and more critical as we move up high in technology readiness level, say 7 to 9. And how we capture that, how we document that, how we exploit that, it becomes very, very important for companies to make a mark in technology licensing in terms of earning the name in technologies. So, first of all, when we talk about IP monetization, uh, do consider other forms of intellectual property, whether it's design, uh, to you know, discuss examples of Apple, there are many such examples. Trademarks, very important. Technologies would get conceptualized, evolve, decline, but if you have earned name, uh, you know, typical example come to my mind is Colgate. Right? People kept on associated toothpaste for a long period of time with the name Colgate. They made a mark by exploiting the trademark. So, this is true for many other industrial technologies also. And the second very important aspect is how do you consider know-how when you are talking about exploiting your technologies. <coughs> Before like, so this, I was in intellectual ventures. So, the minute you people listen to you know, intellectual ventures, you all think that we are patent trolls, our MPVs, not patent derivatives. But it's not always right. Uh, IB does litigate, but IB also had a fund called IDEA, Image and Development Fund. In that fund, we used to go to all the 13, 13 countries, they started these ideas, and they used to go to different universities, only top premium universities, and they go and uh, source the inventors. And they pay, up front, up front, they pay $10,000 to the inventors. Whether the patent is granted or not, it doesn't matter. They used to, each inventor used to get $10,000. All the recycle and the all IITs. Most of the ideas are a part of, I mean, they are, they are collaborating with the idea. Why did they start this actually? Once the, uh, this idea was started by all the uh, Microsoft people, the time people, they started this. Why did they do this? Then you, university have no network of funds, big university get out of funds, so they do basic research. Now, industries will not try to take basic research. 
because that is not proven. It's not in the pyrex scale, right? If you imagine you make the five gram drug in a lab, is it not same as if you want to scale it up to five kgs? There will be so many challenges. Suppose it's an exothermic reaction. I mean, the beginning of the So if it's exothermic reaction and it gives heat, in five grams I take my beaker and put it under the running tap water. I pull it. But same thing if I have to transfer into five kg drug or five kg chemical if I want to make, how do I pull it? I need to have a insulation or something like that I have to take care. So that's where the idea formed the death valley. There is a death valley between basic research and industrial application. That's why they jumped in and they started in 13 countries to build up the portfolio. So we have a portfolio, we have around 3000, 2007 to 2014, we build up portfolio of inventions. So 2014, they are wanted to monetize. That's the whole plan. Unfortunately, we couldn't succeed, succeed in monetizing in India. I'll tell you later. But that's what, that is one monetization technique. It is very, uh, generally we never heard of it. How they are saying it's licensing, cross licensing, it's like this they realized. They said there is a death valley between the basic research and industrial applications. And if you can tap that, uh, take the inventions from the universities, uh, do at least pilot plan and then transfer to the uh, industries. That's, that is one way of monetization technique. So maybe you can uh, talk to Namish, who would like to talk about the uh, licensing. So thank you, Dr. Uh, so I'll take an example of chemical licensing. So you, we are hearing of battery leachy, battery leachy, battery. So then the battery is made of what main three uh, components. It's a cathode, anode, and electrolytes. So in cathode, there is one chemical compound called NMC based NMC based cathode active material. So this NMC uh, is a lithium nickel manganese cobalt compound. It's a solid state chemistry compound and developed by the Argan National Laboratory. That company developed that this uh, product, uh, compound and they licensed it to two companies. One is the BSM, another the Japanese company, Toto Koita. So Toto took a non exclusive license and they tried it to make that product and commercialize it. Because this product was a new thing, so it has some challenge, so nobody was. So they are exploring that whether it can go to the, but it has a capi uh, uh, capacity that we can provide a high capacity uh, battery. BSM took a license, so uh, exclusive license for this one, and they had the rights to sub license. What uh, BSM did, BSM put their own plant to make NMC based cathode active materials. They started supplying to the customer. Similarly, same time, they opened that particular patent that any company wants to make that particular product. They started giving a sub-license. And uh, there was another, they gave the license to the total 16 companies, sub-license. And there are two companies, uh, General Motors and LG, they took a materials license so that it means they are not licensing it, but they are using those materials. So they can buy it from somebody else. So they took uh, that kind of license as well. There is another company, uh, 3M. They developed the same uh, material by a different process. And they gave a license to the Umico. Umico started supplying that material and BSF sued them in 2015. They negotiated, uh, they settled this case out of the court and uh, settled this case in 2017. Uh, in 2021, Yumi Core and BSF signed a cross license uh, licensing agreement for NMC and other allied active cathode active materials covering 100 patents. So now, what is the uh, strategy here? So strategy for BSF was that. We have exploited as much we could do for a single technology. Because when we say technology, it's a evolving technology, and every customer, every partner has a different requirement. So you have to sometimes customize the extra requirement. So when you go for customization, there could be some other patents. So Umico had a different patent, though they had a three of patents, but they could not survive. So they took a license from the BSF, but at the same time they negotiated with them, they went ahead. With the cross licensing. So now the uh, portfolio of the cross licensing is hundreds of patents and covers it globally. 
So now Unique or BSF has the opportunity to serve global players with the, all the kind of uh, requirements what customers are demanding that key whether by cathode active material has to be nickel rich or it has to be manganese rich or has to be lithium rich. So they have, that is the opportunity, that is the strategy call has to be taken by the strategy has to be adopted and has to be taken apart for monetize the IP. So these two companies, if you see, it's like they are going to rule the world based when you say NMC based cathode active materials. That's it's a classic example of how why companies should not only just focus on monetizing but with the thought process that how this is going to play the their strategic objectives. Thank you. So uh, recently I was reading somewhere that the Boeing has developed a, a technology for drilling holes and compound surfaces. Boeing is an aviation giant, but Boeing, I mean, is that uh, drilling holes is not necessarily for aviation industry, right? It can be used for any more automobile industry. Some other industries can also use the technology. So they transfer the technology for which is developed for the aviation to other industries like automobiles and all. So one patent or one technology developed for one industry can be used for other industries also. Like recently we met one FMCG company, they were developing the detergent solutions for domestic appliances. So they were domestic use. So they were asking us, can we transfer our technology to automobile industry? Maybe I have to tweak my cleaning solution a little bit and can I license my uh, in this technology of uh, detergent solutions to uh, automobile industry? Why not? So. What is your thought? Can we really one patent can be given to multiple parties? Uh, yes, it all depends upon the licensing agreement. Licensing can be exclusive and non-exclusive. When you say exclusive, then if at all it can be sold exclusively to one party, giving them right to sub license also to as many as they wish and also further work on the same technology get more patent. That is exclusive. When it is non-exclusive, then you are giving to that party and also if and all the claims have multiple, multiple elements kind of thing of the same. Specific cross part of this technology, only you can give it to some party. At the same time, you may also be liberty that you are not giving exclusive and non exclusive for you for particular business and set under condition, and you can give to multiple other parties also. According to the price will vary. Returns will be vary whether you are giving exclusive or non exclusive, and also if you are not a painted family members in different uh, uh, jurisdiction, whether you are giving a specific family member for specific jurisdictions or to same party with multiple jurisdictions. And similarly, whether you have a right to give to other parties on a similar basis, it all depends on the traditional the element based on which you are doing. If I have to sell any tangible present, so like for this board or for something, for a check, I know how do I value, I know the value of it. I have a, there are standard procedures for finding out the value of a product, tangible asset. How do we figure out? How do we value an intangible asset? So, is there any method of valuation? So, maybe Dr. Mutu can take us through how do we do valuation of a transaction? So, the primary objective here is to understand the context when we do valuation, whether it's for tangible or intangible asset. Why do we need this valuation to be done? Uh, from a intangible asset perspective, is it more like transactional? Are we going to do it for understanding what is the licensing value, sale value of the painting? Or is it for a joint development that we are going to come into? Uh, so what is the value of what our IP is going to have? Or is it going to be for taxation perspective? Or is it for pitching it to a venture firm to understand what value our IP has? Or is it for uh, you know, going in for a bankruptcy situation, what, how do we do that? And then for financial reporting. So, what context is the valuation done for? So, I think that is number one. And two, valuation is not always static. So, what valuation you do six months ago will change after, you know, six months. So, that is not going to be a static number. So, there are 
context and then targets. And then the third part is in terms of understanding the qualitative and the quantitative piece of it. Uh, when we look at assets, we would always look what is the quality, is it a seminal IP or is it something, a me too kind of an IP. So understand the quality and how much of an impact it has across the value chain, segments in the value chain in an industry. Does it just cater to one segment or does it cater to more than one? How many kinds of applications can it touch? Might be a difficult part, but maybe to understand from every industry perspective. And so those are mostly to understand the qualitative metrics and then you identify a factor and weightage for the qualitative assessment part. Now coming to the quantitative part, typically assessment of value is common across any asset, you know, tangible or intangible. So majorly it is the three types of assessment that we do, the cost method, income method and the market method. So cost essentially from a uh, patent perspective, we are trying to assess what is the cost of replacement, meaning if I were to get an IP in this domain, what is it that I have to incur to replace that IP? So that is what you assess typically and that is almost if you take and, and, this, and the most important point of valuation is it's not one number, it is always a range. So when you do your assessment, you will get what is the base value and what is the highest value. What is the lowest value with which I can negotiate and what is the highest value that I can look forward to. So cost typically gives you the lowest of the numbers, what is the lowest range that I can work for. And then the second part is on the income method where you try to see what is the future revenue perspective of this technology of this IP that can provide me in the future. So that is one way. The other is also in terms of how much I am saving by having this IP. So relief from royalty is what you call that method as. So if this is the amount of income that is to be uh, gained and how much am I saving just by having the IP that I protected. So that's the method that you do on income. The last and the most difficult part is market. So, where you have to find equivalent transactions that has happened in your technology domain for your type of IP and find what kind of values that are available in the market. There are publications that come from broker patents, royalty numbers that you get from sources like KT9. So, you try to assess what is the typical you know, uh, value of an equivalent transaction that has happened in the market. So, you, what should always do all these methods to know what is the range of value that they will fit in for whatever asset that they have. And the last bit that I want to touch is on the due diligence. So for each of these assessments, we have to know what is the legal due diligence that has to go, business due diligence, the market due diligence, and technical due diligence. I'm not going to deep, go deep into that, but typically you have to do all this to get a good sense of what value your asset would have. So, I mean, I do you think it is going to generate other, other company who, who, who are rather going to, going to use it for a product or process? And also the patent term left at the time of uh, licensing. And accordingly, there are multiple factors to decide which arrived at a specific value of the patent. Uh, I have got certain data which will be rather amazing if I ask these questions to such an Agash audience. We are sitting in a seven star property. What might be the value? It is a tangible property, tangible physical property, whereas patent IP is an intangible property. What can be value of this uh, property? Maybe 100 million dollars, you may say. You may say two hundred million dollars. Imagining the patent value, which is an intangible property, only a set of documents containing data for technology, is anyway. It's not coming. I mean, I'll just show you. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not As I told you, strategies of an IPR varies on varies from uh, a company and also the capital institutions. When I say capital institutions, their rather their product is technology development, 
my research and development. For example, in India, this are, uh, let's go further. This father says, why should we do uh, this monetization? There are different aspects. This is a source of revenue generation for growth. When we talk about industry, industry wants its competitors to use that technology which has got certain advantages if process in respect to the cost of the process having a uh, rather uh, more value to the product which they uh, make and same time product. Product which has a value depends upon the type of the product. For instance, I give you example, drugs molecule, I give you example of Ibrovastatin, which in US market itself, when the product was protected, had a value of 14 billion dollar per month value. Imagine. And now let's try to in India, as you know, CSIR, also scientific industrial research, this is one of the main government party who has got laboratories in multiple technology domains, almost all, whether they got chemicals, uh, then uh, physical laboratory, food products, leather, likewise. If you look at it, their budget, their budget is 7,144 crore in 2022. And if you look at, they have about 37 laboratories and 39 outreach centers, uh, centers and three innovation centers. It is ranked 37th among 1,587 government institutions worldwide and is the only Indian organization among the top 100 global, uh, global government uh, institutions according to the, who, who will carry out the search on this aspect. Such a big institution. Next please. Now we look at against the budget, what are the revenues they generate or what the IP they generate. This data is for 2016 uh, uh, and 17, I'm sorry, it's not 23, 16, 17, 17, 18. Only 727 crore. Out of which, how much is from the private sector and how much for transfer technology to the government, uh, government uh, manufacturing agencies like BML, BHL, likewise. And in 2078, 963 crore. See the gap between what budget they have got vis-a-vis what revenue generation they have got. Next please. Similarly, IIT, the concept of research in Indian academic research institutions vis-a-vis -vis in advanced countries is that they want to produce only doctorates. They do not have, they go in qualitative basis. We must have this certain number of patents. They don't see the patent which they produce is a product and that product should be sellable, acceptable by the company who eventually have to use it. That concept is lacked because they do not work in close collaboration with the industry around their area. Next slide please. Go to next. Please, go to next. No, where is that the table is there, no? One table. That's the earlier one. No, I will give you some data which uh, which uh, uh, which rather shows as I requested you to gauge the value of this seven star property. Can you imagine in 2012, Wisconsin University of the USA, they had sold on patent to Pfizer for 4.1 billion dollars. Imagine what kind of value it has got. Piche, piche dana. Back. Go back. Because it can carry on automated, but you do try to stay, I don't want to control it. I want to show you that one slide. Back, back. Then I have. Back. Back. Yeah, one, one step back. Again, one back. 
Thank you, sir. 